just wanted to welcome everyone to this uh, IPXO webinar on IP address reputation. Uh, as we move along into IPv4 scarcity and ever-growing demands on security and the internet and good stewardship of IP space, you often hear that IP address holders are concerned with the status of their IP uh, address reputation or what a customer or malicious activity could do to, like, to your IP address reputation. So in this webinar, we're going to discuss IP address reputation management. We're going to look at situations that the IP holders might find themselves in and talk about what is or can be done in this area and look at the future of IP address uh, management. So before I introduce the panelists here, I just wanted to walk through a bit of administ trivia here on, on how we at IPXO like to run these webinars. We want to make them as interactive as possible. So on the side panel, you've got the chat function there. And if you can pose your questions in there at any time uh, during this discussion with the panelists, I will do my best to slide them in where possible and we will uh, see what we can uh, get from our panel of experts. So we have a great lineup of experts on our panel. I'm gonna walk through them in alphabetical order, of course. Uh, Lee Howard, Senior Vice President at Hillco Stream Bank. Paul Judicus, VP of Strategic Alliances at IPXO. Matthew Wilder, Senior Engineer at TELUS Communications. And Jan Schorsch, Vice President at Six Connect Labs. So with that, we've got an hour to go. So I'm just going to jump right in uh, to this webinar and, and, and get us moving with a very general question. And then we will, we will jump into some of the other bits. Um, so what is IP address reputation? And, and, and why is, is IP address reputation important, Lee? Well, thanks, Paul. Nice to be here. Um, and, you know, thanks to, everyone for, thanks, thanks to everybody for being here. Thanks to IPXO for organizing this. So it, it might surprise you that um, there are some security concerns on the Internet. And uh, there are things that people do that other people don't like. So IP address reputation is, uh, is a way for people to make decisions about what traffic, what, what things to allow to or from a, a given IP address based on previous behavior. So uh, there are different ways that that's managed. The most common that, that I think we probably talk about most frequently are there is a, a series of reputation block lists where different people on the internet or, or groups or companies have lists of addresses from which uh, people have seen spam or um, botnets or attacks or um, even vulnerabilities that have not necessarily yet been exploited. And so each of those mm -hmm. kinds of things might create a reputation about that IP address that then might get ad added into a firewall or uh, a router's access control list or even a, uh, a mail server's uh, uh, accept list to say, should we allow uh, email from this address or not? So that's sort of uh, the, the, the top level of, of what that what a reputation is. It's based on previous behavior and then kind of what people are doing with it, why they want that. Okay. Okay, great. So Matthew, like, what are the IP management issues that your company is dealing with, like on a daily basis? Yeah, I mean, with IP reputation and, and IP address efficiency in general, we're constantly moving IP addresses from one purpose to another. Really, the scarcity of IPv4 uh, hits everyone in the industry. And we're a large service provider with millions of customers. And we often launch new services. So moving IP addresses from where they're not being used efficiently to where we want to use them. And in those cases, there may be lingering IP addresses. We lost our sound, Matthew. Are you back there, Matthew? Somehow your sound has cut out on us. Mm -hmm. I think he's going to be logging logging uh, back in. Um, we'll come back to that question. I'm just going to move forward maybe with a question to Jan, if I can just take a look at security concerns when we're dealing with IP uh, reputation. You brought this up. Obviously, everything that, that you've mentioned there, Lee, earlier was... Oh, are you back, Matthew? Let's see. Can you, oh, you are back. Please, okay, the floor is yours. All right. So as I was saying, scarcity hits all providers across the industry. We have millions of customers, and yet we're still launching new services as we continue to grow our subscriber base. So we have mm -hmm. to look at how to be efficient, 
recovering IP addresses from where they're unused or underutilized into areas we want to grow the business. In those cases, we have to look at the IP address reputation, make sure we're not handing out IP addresses that are blacklisted or blocklisted to those new customers. So it definitely matters to us. Okay. Okay. So see there, okay, that's that's uh, very interesting. On, on the point of that, when you start talking about scarcity, uh, and then we all, all and then we bring security into it, I just wanted to roll into a question to Young. Um, what are the security concerns uh, when dealing with IP uh, management or IP reputation? What are the, the largest security concerns here? Well, if if you don't build the security in your in your network, if you don't protect your IPs. From from spitting out uh, the spam uh, or or I don't know if if your users are are uh, uh, doing the, the for example uh, connecting to other uh, people's computers trying to guess SSH passwords or or to IPAM servers and trying to guess you other users' passwords uh, then uh, your your IP addresses will really quickly get into 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 these uh, uh, blacklists or or but, and the problem is that. If all these blacklists are have quite a good API, then you know with 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 IP address management tool you can automate the checking if some IP address space has good or bad reputation in which database it is or not. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem comes to uh, when when your IP addresses are blocked. In, in, in other networks, when they are automatically uh, detecting that your IP addresses have been doing some bad stuff on the internet. And these, are, these, these blocks are not listed nowhere in the, in the centralized um, uh, lists, right? So if you go and, and buy or get one IP address space that, that was from somebody else's, you can check in this central list, but you never know in how many places around the world your your network is is blocked. That means that if you intend to keep the IP space before space that, that you are using, you need to really really make sure that you you deploy all the uh, security measures to protect your IP space from being blocked around the world. And if, mm -hmm. if, that, if that means that you need to disconnect your users because they're doing bad stuff on the internet, so be it. Ah, so if I, if I hear this correctly, then block lists are actually quite, quite important. Matthew, why, why are block lists in, important for, 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 for Telus, for your, for your business? And what functions do they provide to you? Yeah, I mean, one, one interesting case I'll tell you about, um, obviously, Paul, you can appreciate being a Canadian that hockey is super important to Canadian culture. One interesting story that came up in the last year was during the NHL playoffs, National Hockey League playoffs, there was a block list created by the rights distribution holders for NHL playoffs saying, here's a dynamic list of IP addresses you as service providers in Canada have to block so that those IPs obviously were originating streaming for the, uh, the hockey games. So oh, here's wow. just one sort of off case, maybe a new case that, that people haven't been aware of that, uh, that we've seen. And maybe there's going to be more like that in the future. So instead of actually like, you know, uh, coming at it from the perspective of, of blocking malicious activity or what have you, or trying to protect folks, uh, you're using this as a tool to maybe moderate even what's going on with, with traffic flow. Exactly. Yeah, de definitely kind of the, um, the next step or evolution of, of what you would see with a blacklist where you're saying, here's just a published thing that you can use as a consumer of, of those those networks or mail server administration, whatever it is. Uh, but here's a case where a service provider has been told actually by the courts, you have to block these IP addresses. Oh, okay. So this is actually going into the judicial system even, not only into, within network operators. Okay. At least within the Canadian context, yeah. Okay, and has this happened widely, more widely than the, than the hockey area? Have you heard about it in any other cases, or is this just a, a yeah. prime example here? It, it is a prime example where it's actually taken effect, but I would say if you look back to um, one of the, the published uh, articles by the HAG, sorry, not, not articles, but uh, the letter signed by many internet experts, the final recommendation for internet sanctions against Russia was actually to have a potential block list of IP addresses 
known to be distributing misinformation or disinformation. And although I don't know if that ever took effect, there's an example where in international space, there's some sort of thought about maybe doing something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. okay, and Paulius, yeah, uh, please. Uh, why why are they important? Why are they important to your to your business? Yeah, so Matthew kind of sprung a couple of ideas to me, and I know one one example that completely matches the one with NHL. Well, the one with hockey. Uh, I know for a fact that during these crypto mining craze times, uh, retailers are actually battling scalpels uh, that that are buying uh, GPUs in bulk exactly by doing. Exactly, exactly the same like Matthew described. Uh, they're putting potentially or already known uh, IP address space and well uh, subnets onto the block list just for the days of GPU releases, and they uh, they are achieving exactly the same result. As from our business perspective, we started delving into ASN area more, and again, stealing this idea from Matthew. Uh, these are due to, well, uh, sanctions imposed to Russia, more specifically. As we are leasing IP addresses, we started looking into AS numbers that those IP addresses are being announced to. And, mm -hmm. you know, e even though the final ASN might be different, we started digging into AS paths. And we noticed, well, quite a lot of traffic going from through Ross Telecom, for example. So we are imposing... This this sort of block lists for AS numbers right now because, well, yeah, uh, we, we're imposing these sanctions and we're truly supporting them. Okay, okay. So moving on from from this area, I'd like to touch a little bit on best practices for IP address reputation management. Um, should IPAM be done as, as an you know by an in-house team or should IPAM services? be provided by an external source, kind of like an IPAM as a service. Like what are the key points for each of these? Jan? Well, I work for the for, for the IPAM vendor, so <laughs> I, should, I should tell you, you shouldn't be doing it in-house, right? Because... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like well, I hope you're going to give me a more balanced view. <laughs> <to start. Exactly. laughs> no, but um, I think... Um, there are there are many great uh, also open source uh, IP address management uh, softwares ah. out there uh, mm -hmm. that are also doing a great job. So mm -hmm. today there is no point in in building your own in house IP address management because you can you have a variety of options of, from from the commercial ones to the open source ones. Each of them can do different things, and mm -hmm. but uh, you know. <sighs> And with 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 IPv4 addresses going going out being depleted, uh, and IPv6 coming in, IP IP address management is becoming even more important because in IPv4 people was mostly doing it with 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 an Excel sheet and be done with it. Mm -hmm. It's not a huge network, right? Right. And the. One of the points that people are using IP address management in IPv4 is because some of them still can't um, can't uh, uh, divide the the address space properly, especially when it comes down to lower than slash twenty four. Then lots mm -hmm. of people get lost there. They do it completely wrong. That's why okay. you have a good IP address management. Then it just does automatically for you everything, right? And then you you, okay. you keep track of this. And also with IP address management, you can automate the daily or, or, or weekly check of the central uh, blacklists uh, if they have an API, how your IP space is doing, if, if the reputation is good or bad, and these things. But with IPv6 coming in, uh, I, I, I can't see the network being managed with, with Excel sheets anymore. It's, it just doesn't scale. Mm. Okay, so, and, and so you mentioned something really interesting at, at the beginning of this to me. I mean, this makes a lot of, lot of sense to me. Open source, you know, is IPAM really today, is it only reserved for the larger network operators or those that have got teams of software developers? Or is there open source out there that also caters for the smaller and maybe medium-sized network operators? I'm using, I'm using IP address management tool for, for my house. <laughs> okay, all right. 
so there are these 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 open source uh, IPAM, and and are they reliable? Well, they are reliable, but they are often lacking the the more advanced features, so the, the the automation and all this stuff. They are more um, like uh, you know you you enter the the uh, your IP space and then then you you start breaking it down, and that's majority it. With uh, okay. with more uh, advanced IP address management, you can you can say okay, I am I'm also managing the reverse zone, right? Because I'm dealing with IP space, uh, and then you can talk to to your DNS servers and push your zone there. So you automate your your DNS de deployment. Then you can you can manage your forward zones in DNS, and you can push it. You can basically manage from IP address management. You can manage your your DNS servers, and then you. If it's IP address management, then this means that if you assign one block of IP addresses to a customer, then the, the, the more advanced software can connect to a router and actually create a BGP session. So IP address management tools, if it's good and it has a good development team behind it, um, soon uh, becomes a network automation tool. And that's that's okay. where, where IP address management is currently going. Okay, and I'd like to ask a question. But there is a question uh, from the from uh, the uh, actually. Well, what I want to do is I want to return back to this idea of the best common practices. Give you a moment to think about this. But we do have a question that's come into the question area. It's in case of an ISP with uh, CGNAT uh, deployment, how these ISPs can avoid. IP blacklisting on multiple RBLs. That's a tricky one. Uh, there is no answer to that because usually the ISP is supposed to be a tube, right? Provide traffic access for the user to the internet. ISP is not supposed to look into the user's traffic, right? Uh, but if you have a CGNet, or if you don't have a CGNet, it doesn't matter. If, if you don't look into your user traffic, you can't prevent bad things from coming out of your network and causing your IP space going into, into blacklists. So it's, it's a chicken and egg problem. Should I look into user's traffic and uh, actually protect my IP space? With, with clear understanding that I shouldn't be doing this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So, <laughs> Hitesh, I hope that answers your 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 question there. Uh, so I wanted to return back to the best comment. Can I, can uh, I respond? Yeah, best... Can, I respond to, uh, can I respond to that as well? Absolutely, Lee. Please. Thank you. So, uh, without without saying should, um, because I don't. I'm an, I'm an engineer. I don't like making moral judgments on what, what, what somebody should do or shouldn't do. <laughs> I will say that um, the messaging and mail anti-abuse working group, working group MOG, um, did put out a recommendation, a best practice document 10 or 12 years ago that says that ISPs should block, residential ISPs should block uh, SMTP traffic, you know, uh, port 25 outbound, that users you know that, that the expectation is that residential users are not running mail servers at home um we can say whether you know whether they should be or shouldn't be and there's you know lots of issues around that but there is a standards body that has come out that has made a recommendation that the best pre current practice is to prevent that so if you are preventing the users who are behind that carrier grade nat from from sending outbound email it is therefore much less likely that they will get uh, that that a spam trap will 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 uh, receive spam and therefore would block any of those addresses. There are other things that you could do as an engineer, which is have fewer users behind each address on your CGNAT. So if you've got a hundred users, it's a little more likely that one of them is going to get infected with a botnet that's going to start sending spam. That's going to therefore get you your your petition blocked. If you have that, you know, if one of those hundred users sends spam. Well, then that then 100 users are affected by that reputation. If there are 10 users behind a single address, well, then it's less likely that one of them is going to send spam, and only 10 users would be affected. So those are the kinds of that. That's sort of where I would start to look. There is those those are two different practices that, that you could undertake. Um, 
Okay. Yeah, and Lee, could you, you know, when you've got a moment in the chat function, can you just, can you share that source with us of where people can actually go and reference that? But before that, uh, Hitesh is asking a few questions to follow up on this. He's, he is referring to residential ISPs where we provide dynamic IP address to residential users. How so does, how does this how, fare? How does that connect to the first question? They have CGNet and they provide dynamic IP addresses. So they provide dynamic private IP addresses to residential users. It's, well, anyway, um, uh, I, just, I, I wanted to add another thing to, to what Lee said. I believe Barrack recommendation uh, is to not have more than 16 users behind, uh, behind uh, one IP address. That's how you can also, uh, if there is a some crime or criminal offense, some criminal action coming out of that IP, that's how they can easily um, uh, search uh, for, for it. But, you know, deploy mm -hmm. IP6 and you, you get rid of all these problems. <laughs> ah, okay, we will come to IPv6 uh, a little further down in this piece, but thank you, thank you, Jan. So uh, Matthew, like, have you experienced any extraordinary issues dealing with IP management or reputation that you wanna share, like outside of the hockey bit? I think the hockey bit's kind of the most interesting case that I could uh, okay. come up with for the, the webinar today. Nothing really out right. of the ordinary otherwise. I mean, it's just sort of the standard, you know, someone wants to be delisted from, from Sorbs or one of those other listing services. Um, mm -hmm. And actually sort of tying it back to the last question there about residential ISP. Um, Sorbs categorically will not help you if you've got dynamic IP assignment. They say it has to be static um, and it, it you know, to Lee's point, it really ties into the expectation of, of what type of activities should be originating from residential versus business. And, and uh, typically, uh, and I don't know if Sorbs is, is perfectly exemplary of all the other blacklisting services, but um, static IP is kind of the expectation more or less. Like you want to see that um, this customer or company is, is using those IP addresses. If there's some kind of attribution in that sense, there's a little more grounds for reputation. It's almost like brick and mortar uh, online in that, that sense. Okay, all right, That's interesting. Okay, so we, we, we move along here. So we, when we take a look at how does IP reputation affect the potential value of your IP address space or actually does it? Um, this is something I'd, I'd like to start with Lee here if I can. How does IP reputation affect uh, the transfer process? For instance, so it, it it's um, it, well. Basically, would would you want to buy addresses that had a bad reputation? Would you want to live in a neighborhood that had bad reputation? And the answer is, I mean, arguably, it could be that there are buyers who would say, "I'm not going to use this this slash twenty four for residential users or for mail servers, and therefore I don't care." Um, but in practice, uh, when you provide a report to a potential buyer of addresses. If it says this has been used for malware or, or malicious activity of some kind, that this has been listed on somebody's block list or somebody's has some kind of negative reputation, it, it doesn't just diminish the value. It makes most people just walk away. There are enough addresses in the market that they'll, they'll go find something that is clean. Mm -hmm. And so there are uh, companies that will help manage, you know, Matt mentioned um, Sorbs, there's Spam House, there, there's dozens of, of RBLs, reputation block lists. Um, and there are mm -hmm. certainly you know, companies that will help do the inspection, find out what's you know, wh where they're listed, and then uh, undertake some work to, to help you clean those up, uh, to remove those entries. And some of them are harder than others, uh, as, you, as, as you said. Okay. You know, the uh, Sorbs will not, you know, won't touch it if it's been dynamically allocated. Whereas others, Spam House actually lists, has a specific list that is, you can say this slash 16, this slash 18, whatever, is all dynamically allocated. So Make of that what you will. You, know, you, you can use that for whatever information you, as the consumer of that reputation list, would use. Uh, I'm sure. And, and, and normally, and normally, and I will get to you, Jan. I see your hand up. I just want to, him to follow up on this a little bit, Lee. So, and normally, does does someone who is looking for address space actually follow the line of taking a look at the reputation of that space? Well, that varies a lot. 
Um, and, and I will say that, uh, you know, some people do provide a, and I'm trying not to be too commercial, um, but some people do provide a, a, a proactive, here's a, here's a, a, a list of all of the lists, all the RBLs that we've checked, and you can see that there's uh, no negative information here. Um, some people just don't care. And so, um, and there are even some sophisticated buyers who will do their own diligence. I'll, right. I'll look at your report if you want me to, but I have my own list of, of lists that I specifically care about and that, that, that I know that, that we use. Right. And Jan, what did you want to add there? Yeah, but I, 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 have, I, have, I, have, I have a question for, for, for Lee. Did you, have, did you already have a case where, for example, if you look at the RBL blacklist, that's for email, right? And what if you would have to move the block uh, uh, to somebody else that was used for for uh, IP scanning, um, uh, SSH attacks, uh, IMAP attacks, and this would not go into any of these lists. But if they would do it over the whole internet, this IP space would be blocked in in majority of the networks that detect and 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 block uh, traffic from these addresses. How? How can we figure out if a block of these addresses is at, does actually work? Can talk to other people? Well, there are lists that, that do include not just spam, but other kinds of, mm -hmm. of scanning or, or malware attacks. Or, or as I mentioned, um, I, I think Spam House in particular has one that is looking for open relays or, or other you know other vulnerabilities. That uh, that could be exploited, even if they haven't detected any any attacks from them. Um, Barracuda is another one that um, that is looking for all kinds of malicious activity, and will will report on that uh, in some of their lists as well. So hopefully they show up there. Um, I haven't seen a case where uh, somebody said this block of addresses is just completely unusable uh, because it's been. I'm knocking wood here. Like good, so so far. Uh, because it's been used, because it's been uh, overly used for for malicious activity. I was, more common is something that Matthew referred to earlier. That is the uh, where implied uh, earlier was the geolocation, where the you know some there's you know residential users are not allowed to access their bank because their bank says, well, we don't have any users in this coming from this country. Well, the addresses aren't in that country anymore. They've, they've been transferred. They're in a, a different place right now. But there's stale mm -hmm. information in somebody's database somewhere. Uh, and that can happen with, with privately maintained RBLs as well. Um, or, again, that's example, a streaming service can certainly have its own list of geolocation and say, we don't allow streaming to people in this country. Well, except that mm -hmm. then you've got a VPN mm -hmm. provider who wants to use addresses that have different geolocation information. Mm -hmm. So essentially, the IP reputation is actually then transferred to a new owner because we all know that your addresses kind of come and go within holdership. So with that transfer, in any case, that that reputation follows that IP address. Is that true? Yeah. If okay. I could do, and I, I think my my uh, my thought would be that because of the emergence of of the market. Uh, a decade ago now, uh, I, I think there's sort of a game of catch up that's going to have to be had here by these reputation uh, management engines or service providers. Um, they have to kind of attune themselves now to that sense of if you have a transfer, it kind of needs to be a clean slate. Um, I think of this even internally, let's say I've got IPs allocated to TELUS. Uh, I'm using them for customer A one day and then I move it to customer B after it's been freed up. That's even sort of a, an opportunity for those reputation management service providers to sort of do a refresh on that IP range as well. And I think that's mm -hmm. that's where we're going to have to see things go. Oh, well, yeah. absolutely. I think that I think that there, people would want to have the service that if they were going to take this space and it has some kind of a reputation behind it, that it's possible to get them to get that cleared out so that they're usable again <laughs> the way they would be within how you need to use them in the Internet. Right. That's mm -hmm. a very good point. Yeah. Uh, if I may add on that point, Matthew, that's an excellent point. And IP address, reputation, and inheritance, I guess we should call it something like that. I feel like yeah. this is starting to become more and more of an issue because we've been seeing blocked networks uh, that, yes, they those IP addresses might have done some malicious activities 
10, 15 years ago, they changed hands twice already, uh, but mm -hmm. end users still cannot, you know, uh, either connect to some networks uh, or they're just simply sitting on way, way, way outdated who is data uh, without any ability to, to, you know, fix all this. And yeah, that's a perfect point. I feel like block lists and other RBLs uh, should become, should begin looking into either change of ownership or at least change in allocations, you know, whenever, and I'm, yeah, I'm a big supporter of, of clean slate for IP addresses because in my books, at least IP address reputation inheritance is something that should become obsolete as soon as possible. Yeah. And is there any work being done on that? Is that being discussed in any fora, like how this can be tackled? Well, I personally have been discussing this with a couple of people, but again, this is just, you know, uh, in a layer of talks, not, nothing more. I don't know but the internals of any RBLs. Maybe some of you guys have heard anything about it. I'm, I'm any standards bodies, next... working groups or anything? So it's, it's part of the reason that I'm going to the next MOG conference in late October in Brooklyn, uh, is that it's, I, I want to talk to the, the RBL maintainers about uh, what are their concerns and because I can imagine that there are some circumstances where they would say, look, just because a block has been allocated from one organization to another or reassigned differently, what's to prevent a spammer from just doing a, uh, you know, a, a merger and acquisition transfer? It does, it's, it's the same, same organization or doing another transfer. Right. Couldn't you, couldn't somebody with, you know, malicious intent, you know, sort of scrub their addresses, their own addresses that way. So there may be more. And then start over again. In, right. And then start, right, exactly. And so there certainly may be uh, concerns that, that we want to work through, but I think those are probably technical concerns that could be addressed and we need to uh, want to discuss it with them. So I'm hoping to okay. be able to um, have some, some more of those conversations. And is that event posted on the, on the website you've listed here, that upcoming yes. event? Okay, good. Good. Um, so, you know, we all know that there's a, there's a way to somehow clean the address space. I mean, people, people talk about the processes, walking through, figuring out how to clean the space, so to speak. So even after they have been cleaned, is there some metadata lying around or whatever on the history of what's happened there? Can you ever scratch that clean or will there always be some kind of data flowing around somewhere on what was happening with that space, even after it has been quote unquote cleaned? Maybe I'll, I'll take a crack at it. Um, I think in, in Canada, at least, we have sort of a data retention policy framework that, that says, you know, how long should you keep any particular type of data? I, I suspect mm -hmm. that that's not going to be the case everywhere. So um, this could potentially linger. Um, and, and there's more and more metadata, I'd say, these days. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, you look at geolocation information. There's, there's some decent mm -hmm. services there that help point to where an IP address is used. Um, mm -hmm. And some of that's drawn from, you know, Aaron who is or whatever um, RIR data that, that those sources can find. There's also, you know, RFC 8805, where people can self-publish geolocation information. Um, so these are just two examples of how mm -hmm. that can be shared initially and, and how outside parties can discern what's, what's being used and how to a certain degree. Um, mm -hmm. And, and yeah, I suspect that overall, uh, it's going to be a, a mixed bag as far as how people are using those uh, bits of information and how long they retain that information. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you want to get involved in the discussions here, like on IP reputation, like where, where do you go? Where would you go? You know, this is probably discussed in, in, in a variety of fora. Like, where do you think someone should start if they want to understand maybe a little bit more about getting involved and in, in shaping what's happening out there? Are there any areas of discussion outside of this, uh, the, the MOG uh, org that you've mentioned here? Like, you've, you've got this down, but anywhere else? Well, more. there's certainly, you know, information. Yeah, right. There's certainly information security groups as well that, that are directly related. And so um, people who maintain firewalls are looking for what are the best practices around the, the, the rules that I put in my firewalls. Because there's other things that we sort of um, related, but we haven't talked about that are the lists of bogons or Martians, you know, addresses that are 
never going to be routed on the, on the public internet or addresses that have not been allocated to anybody. And therefore, you're, if you see traffic coming from them, those addresses, then you know it's, it, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's somebody hijacking the address space. Somebody, so there's yeah, other it's been things, hijacked. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you're, when you're running a, a firewall or, or even writing an ACL for your router, or, um, or especially if you're managing a, a mail server, uh, you probably definitely want to find some of this, so the, I would say support groups, but the, um, the operators groups around those to help you. Um, mm -hmm. There's a uh, DNS OARC for um, DNS operators. Uh, lots of different, you know, how do you secure those? And what are the right ways to mitigate traffic there? There may be other mm -hmm. more, even more fine tuned kinds of uh, knobs that you want to turn, like uh, rate limiting for certain traffic, or mm -hmm. uh, there's, um, you know, IP fix NetFlow information that you can use uh, flow spec to, to, to define your response to ongoing issues. But that's all, um, you know, Nano is probably a good place for some of those, those as well, because that's all um, into how are you writing your security policy? Where's the information right. coming from that you're using those policies? Mm -hmm. Okay. And speaking of hijacking, like, because I know that there, you know, there was a lot of increased incidences of this happening. Um, it has been on the rise. Matthew, like, is that something that you experienced at TELUS? Like, is hijacking one of the, one of the areas that, that you have with the IP reputation? Is that your customer base quite worried about that? Um, by and large, no. Um, hijacking isn't, isn't a frequent occurrence. Um, and I, I take by that, Paul, you're talking about BGP hijacking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. so BHP hijacking, I don't think, I think there may have been a couple incidents in Canada, um, and it has come to the, the security mindset of, of Canadians, especially as it relates to, you know, working with the government and making sure that our infrastructure is protected, um, and we've implemented RPKI at TELUS, I know others, mm -hmm. other large providers in, in Canada have done the same or are undertaking that project, um, so I think, you know, by and large, if, it, if it's just sort of your, your average Joe customer on the residential side or even small uh, medium businesses, most of them are not thinking about it, maybe not even aware of that, that possibility. Um, it's, just, it's just too rare to, to be on their minds. But some of the larger <laughs> enterprises, um, certainly the government itself as a customer, cares about that, that particular type of occurrence. And, uh, and yeah, we do protect them with RPKI. Okay. Yes, of course. Yeah. So, and Paulius, what what is, what is the customer base at, at IPXO uh, most concerned about when they take a look at their IP reputation? Is it a concern? Uh, well, it depends. If we're talking about IP holders or IP leases, if we're looking into IP holders' perspective, uh, we decided to implement and what we call initial IP reputation check whenever someone's adding those IP addresses to a marketplace. So right. we are scanning, scanning every single subnet, every single IP address across almost 100 different block lists, meaning we are sure that those IP addresses are clean, that they, they reach the marketplace. If something's right. wrong, we, we happily assist uh, for, like IP holders with the best practices, the procedures needed to delist uh, those IP addresses. If we're looking from Lizzie's, uh so, well, they are sure that everything they see is clean. If mm -hmm. something happens, and we do understand that uh, IP reputation is a topic that you cannot always guarantee you're going to keep IP addresses like in top-notch, pristine condition, especially if you're looking mm -hmm. into infrastructure hosting providers, ISPs, they're, they're assigning those IP addresses further downstream to, to their end customers. And obviously, it does happen, but you know, whenever it comes to, I'd say, correct management of IP reputation, SLAs, processes, and well, especially alignment between those two are are the cornerstones on on keeping the IP addresses clean. And I feel like uh, at least like our best practices are looking into potential disease and trying to you know, figure out the patterns, figure out uh, their usual behavior and basically stop any any potential abuse before it actually happens. So, yeah, we, we understand that we're working with third-party resources here at APXO, so we look into this with extra care and caution. Okay. Jan, 
Did you have something to add there? Yes, uh, I would like to add to the to the hijacking uh, uh, part that that we had. Right. Before. In, right. Interestingly enough, um, uh, they went into into the the history of of, of so called hijacks, and they went into deep into why why they happened, and the ma vast majority of them were not hijacks. They were just misorigination. It was basically a typo in the config, fat fingers, or or somebody did not understand properly the BGP protocol, mm -hmm. and and you know the, things happens. And uh, yeah, I think it's like 90% of them were just mistakes and, and not the actual hijack. So I, I call them misorigination, not hijack. Okay. Ah, <laughs> that's a good word. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and that is a very Jan, you were, Jan, you were invo involved in the development of manners, weren't you? Uh, yeah, I, I actually helped Andre write the, the first draft of manners. Uh -huh. Because there are other things, so there's RPKI, but there are other things that are included in how to prevent hijacking, how to secure, you know, how to help secure the the the, <coughs> the routing infrastructure. Yeah, but you know, okay. if you when when you deploy R RPKI or if you deploy BCP thirty eight with all the filtering and and all the stuff, you basically protect the internet from you. You don't protect you from the internet. <laughs> and then when everybody right. is doing it, then the internet will be safe or a safe safer place but until then you know so but i just okay. want to share some of those best practices you best current practice 38 bcp 38 is the standard that says don't allow uh traffic from addresses that are yours that originates outside of your network exactly. right that's probably not good traffic to accept right <laughs> um and and when you're speaking bgp especially if you're speaking bgp with a customer put a route map on that connection so that you're only accepting route announcements from them that are the routes that you've actually checked. And you can use uh, the internet routing registries for that. RipeDB is very robust, but there's, you know, Aaron has a routing registry, RP, there's a RADB, lots of different routing registries. So you can configure some of that dynamically. But the point there is you're protecting yourself against your customers fat fingering or figuring, misoriginating prefixes. Mm -hmm. So in that case, you are protecting yourself. Yes, but, you know, that's for, for many operators, that's a lot of work. The easiest is, you know, just to enable BGP and let, and accept everything that they are sending. You know, that's, you know, that's done that's in, in seconds. But if you want yes. to protect yourself properly, then, you know, you, you, need, you need to spare, you need, you need to put in some work. Now, okay. I also want to sort of especially revalidate something that Paulie has said a minute, a minute ago, too. That's, that I think is related, but it's also kind of related to something I wanted to say about the CGN question, that one of the most important things you can do to protect your reputation is actually monitor your abuse contact, your abuse mailbox. Because if somebody sends one message that gets flagged as spam once, that's probably not going directly into, that may just be that somebody, you know, whoever received it went, I didn't want to receive that message. And rather than unsubscribe or delete, they hit this, the spam button. It's the when it becomes a pattern is when you do something, but you want to get on top, get in front of that as in, immediately when you start to receive abuse reports. And so you need to make sure that somebody's monitoring those and you have a process to respond to, to those re complaints that there's abuse coming from your network. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So kind of taking a look at, you know, uh, IPAM tools, like in, in, in particular, is there, are there any IPAM tools or software that ever kind of like become the, the industry norm or the industry standard that you can, that you can point to open source, particularly, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of commercial uh, applications out there, uh, you know, software out there as well, but any, any good or anything that's becoming kind of industry standard that you've seen in trends. It's a robust marketplace. There are lots of competitors in the in the IP address management space. Um, and, and Jan mentioned earlier about many of them tie into your DNS, even your DHCP. And those sort of DNS, DHCP, internet, uh, IP address management, DDI is, is the acronym if you're looking for something that does all of those things. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. But most of them don't, don't they, they'll help you organize your address space, but they're not going to help you protect the reputation of it. Um, unless you're doing some kind of specific policy uh, to, to apply to it. But 
Jan, you are an IPAM company, so correct me if I misunderstand what, what I no, need to it's, do. It's, yeah. Uh, so if you if you build your IPAM in in a rigid way that is doing this 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 and this and cannot be changed, then you will have a hard time implementing any new modules that that would even potentially take care about your uh, reputation management. But mm -hmm. if you build your address management software in a way that is becoming a network automation and 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 uh, is doing all these these new things that you 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 can add stuff easily i don't think it's it's it should be really hard to build good models for the for the ip rep reputation providing that uh, these databases have a good api i don't want to mm -hmm. waste time and resources with 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 scripting some weird stuff just give me the api and i will take care of the rest Right. So you can okay. take your configuration automation to both apply some of the best practices we've talked about in your configurations and also incorporate the feeds from the RBLs in, from, in terms of managing outbound traffic. So for, for, for example, if, you, if your IP address management software talks to a router to create a BGP session with your new customer, then you can uh, apply some of BCP38 and, and filtering and, and all this stuff. So it can be automated. I, I think okay. there's a market opportunity here. Um, there's there's so many different RBLs. Um, if if someone were to aggregate all that information and provide APIs to to easily indicate where there may be issues and also how to update those automatically, uh, that would be a very compelling kind of use case. So I think the umbrella R RBL. Fantastic. And is there anybody kind of working on that? Is there any discussion on that? Yeah, out there. The, the, there are there are some there are a couple of companies that do that. Um, MX Toolbox is one that I've seen online. I'm no affiliation, mm -hmm. don't know them at all. Um, one of the problems with with some of those tools is, I mean, Jan said a couple times, if they have robust APIs, that's great. But a lot of them really only allow one address query at a time. And so, if I'm trying to check on a customer's, a, a seller's, or a, a, for probably a, a lessor's address block, I need to check an entire slash 24 or you know, a slash 16. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of individual queries. And in fact, can both violate their terms of use and maybe, you know, trigger some rate limiting if I'm, you know, slamming them too hard. And we're, it's, it's, most of them are done by DNS lookup. So you're just doing a, you know, a, a dig command. And yeah. that's, um, <laughs> yeah. so in those cases, it's, um, if they're not providing any way to get access to the entire database or get access per for blocks of addresses really difficult to make sure that that you know what's going on with a block of addresses you can do individual addresses with most of them but it's the it's the when you're, when you're trying to check everything in a block that or or you know for goodness sake if it turns out that an entire block has been listed or or twenty thousand addresses out of a slash 16 have been listed for some kind of you know, infected with a botnet or something some of them require that you go in and delist one by one. And that's yeah. a really, yeah. I think Polyus was, and I were talking about this the other day. That's, that's a really negative experience from a user perspective. Oh, definitely. And in, definitely. In, in the worst case scenario, you grab information from the HTML code that you get from some website and, and then try to understand if that address is affected or not. That's been there, done that. I never want to repeat again. Great. So, so with that in mind, like, what is the future of IP uh, uh, reputation management? Where where does this move? Especially if we can take a look at this, maybe from a V six perspective. Jan, I'd really like to get your your viewpoint on this. Yeah. So we we try to think that we vaguely know how to to do uh, IP reputation on IPv four. But now my, my concern is how we're going not to do it in IPv6 because the, the RBLs and blacklists will clearly not work because first problem is what kind of space would you block if, <laughs> if, uh, if, uh, if something bad comes from that space? Would it be slash 56? Would it be slash 48? Some, uh -huh. some operators assign slash 48 to the end customer. Some operators right. do slash 56. Some of them do it dynamically. Would you block the whole AS? Would you block like 
a bigger chunk, smaller chunk, you know, how, how to effectively, and I, I think that we will have to think of a completely new method, how to provide this information, because providing it based on numbers on, on, on IP address, in IP, IPv6 space is so huge and so mm -hmm. large that mm -hmm. um, I think uh, it's like uh, uh, chasing the needle in a, in, in a stack of hay. Because yeah. to block one IP, I can, I can go and jump IPs all day long and start sending emails and you will not be able to, to, to block me, right? Because, you know, yeah. we don't have a common understanding what is the block size to block. Right. right? And what's your take on that, Matthew? Yeah, I think I think Jan's absolutely right. Um, there, there's sort of a lack of uh, there's an information asymmetry problem here, right? So the provider knows how he's portioned up his his uh, address space, but the the guy on the other end has no idea. Mm -hmm. So I think to a certain degree, maybe you could solve it a bit through something like, um, if not the registry or RFC eighty eight zero five, something along those lines to publish um, that type of information. Um, maybe there's a, a case for something new to be to be had here. Maybe a new I, RFC draft will be coming from Jan soon. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> the problem is that we we still don't have any idea how to how to tackle that because right. in IPv6, so in 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 IPv4, RBLs were were used for 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 blocking emails coming from from that IPs, and then now they are they are also used for IP reputation when we are selling and buying IP space. In IPv6, we will not be selling and buying IP space. So that, that part is, is, is gone. On right. the other hand, we can implement some mechanisms that would detect on the edge of our network. Uh, and, and we would start building our own databases, each operator, and, and start to understand uh, which part of address space is malicious and which part is not. But again, how big is the block that 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 you should block, right? Should you block the whole AS? Uh, that's not fair, right? So I I think we we need to start the discussion on that because the problem is that when now we are moving on IPv6, we're implementing services on IPv6, and it's slowly going up. Email is email is a problem because people say. We don't want to to implement mail on dual stack because we don't have uh, uh, this these mechanisms for for like RBLs and and these things uh, uh, for mail on IPv6. Therefore, we are not we are not doing dual stack because we are afraid that lots of spam would that can come in through IPv6 and we will not be able to block it. So we don't have a parity of of uh, of uh, um, of RBL on on both addresses, and this is actually a big roadblock for for IPv6 mail services to 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 be to start working. And Google is doing some good progress in that. They are really strict on IPv6 uh, with with uh, with uh, SPF, with DMARC, DKIM, and you need to 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 have um, the reverse uh, record done properly and, and all these things. So maybe maybe we should we should look into into standardizing uh, these things first. Okay. So I have, I have a question here that's come from from the audience. Uh, how about developing an AI tool for managing IPv6 address reputation and management? Any step in this direction? How would AI tool? I think. Uh, I, I, I tend to agree with with both what Matt and Jan have said about the the, the, the difficulty in the space. If, as, as Matthew said, if we had a way to publish, I'm an ISP, I assign slash 56s to my customers, then an, an AI tool might be able to grab that information and and infer if I see one, you know, one spam message or, or one, one address slash 56 being negative, then I'm going to block the entire slash 56 or 48 or 64, whatever the right size mm -hmm. is. I think there's probably mm -hmm. some, some some work that could be done there that, that's that's interesting. Um, but there's also mm -hmm. the, the matter of, you know, I, I think probably if the, if the last 10,000 hosts in the world that didn't move to IPv6 were mail servers, like, okay, then they were in a pretty good position if everything else is, uh, has migrated. Uh, and that's for the right. server, server community. <laughs> for, oh, for wow. User, 
if you're using a real server, that's you know that that's often over you know HTTP. So that's easily done over IPv6. Okay. So you're all in agreement that the RBLs won't scale. They that won't that won't work when when v6 comes into when and if v6 comes into 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 play on a on a larger scale. Or at the very least, they'll have to make a very round assumption about how the addresses are partitioned. Like slash forty eight, maybe that's the assumption. Is if you get a, a bad um, IP there, block the slash forty eight, and assume that that the rest there is is not to be trusted. So the, the, pro the problem, the problem is not that uh, the RBLs won't scale. They doesn't scale. It doesn't scale. Yeah, not that they won't because they don't want to, but they just, it, it's not possible, right? So, I mean, but you're talking about a lot of potential address wastage, which I think in V6 isn't really an issue, right? But I mean, this is... Uh, this isn't really a great use of a resource, is it? I mean, if that's I if that's the function that has to be brought in. I think you do different heuristics uh, in, in IPv6. I think that you rely more strongly on reverse DNS. If there's no reverse DNS, or if it doesn't say mail server or something, then you're going to assume that it's not actually a mail server. Every reliable, every you know, well-managed mail server has reverse DNS, um, mm -hmm. and, and, that, and it matches the forward DNS. Um, mm. The things you could do to say, um, I received, you know, I've seen malicious activity on this slash 64, so I'm going to assign it a negative score of 100, and the two adjacent 64 is a negative score of 90, and the adjacent 64 mm -hmm. is 80, and so on. So that if you were to see nearby uh, malicious activity, you might add up to a combined negative score someplace where you hadn't actually seen something. Uh, so there's okay. other things in here that, other ways to go at it. Oh, I did also All write right. an RFC on how to do reverse DNS and IPv6. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So this there is there's like clearly some room for discussion here because you know when and if the IPv6 uh, we see the uptake happening here, then we've got a we've got a very large problem. This is a big hole. Right. Yeah, and and this is the this is the roadblock to for for the mail service on IPv6. So we need to fix it. But, but just but really just for the mail servers, I think I don't want to say that because we haven't figured out this one problem on this one kind of service that you can't do IPv6 and everything else. No, 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 no. Uh, completely, com completely agree. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. just, I'm just saying, what is, what is keeping email servers from, from going on IPv6? Because I keep receiving this question, like for, for the last ten years. Right? Mm -hmm. We would mm -hmm. like to put IPv6 on the mail server, but do we have RBL? And my, my answer is no. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's another question that's come in here, clearly pointed on IPXO. I own an IPv4 block that IPXO is currently leasing on my behalf to a third party. If the uh, renter becomes uh, nefarious, who is responsible for cleaning up the reputation? Uh, who's going to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I uh, want the answer from the other folks, too. I want to understand what they're saying here. I want to I want to hear you, Paulius, and then I want to hear the others. <laughs> OK, I'm joking. Um, well, as I've already mentioned, first off and foremost, we make sure that we shouldn't and we wouldn't see these sort of malicious malicious players in our Lizzy portfolio. If it does mm -hmm. happen, it's up to us and Lizzy, the end user, to clean those subnets. We will provide them with all of the needed knowledge, information, and tools uh, mm -hmm. to, to clean those IP addresses that were listed or added into some sort of RBL. If, for example, it has, hasn't had happened uh, up until this mm -hmm. day, but let's say Lizzy would uh, like block the subnet and disappear, it would be our duty to, to clean up the space for, for IP holder, obviously. Okay. Okay. And the others? You've yeah, I mean, this I, would say, I would say for, for my, my view as a service provider is, is very similar to Paulius's answer. You know, we, we are responsible mm -hmm. for that. And, on, you know, part of that, too, is enforcing an acceptable use policy for our customers, making sure that they're adhering to some principles. So, uh, okay. yeah, I, I'd agree. So whoever okay. is uh, written in the QS database for that, uh, for that space is responsible for, for keeping it clean. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Okay, so um, yeah, this is actually it's it's uh, uh, time for this webinar to 
finish. So are there any any last bits that anyone wanted to add here? Anything that we should keep an eye on that we haven't mentioned here so far? I think it may be interesting in a year to come back and check on yeah. some of the questions that came up about about the RBLs and about uh, how they how they will scale in IPv4, how they scale through the leasing market and the the, the, the sale transfer market um, to see uh, if there uh, you know if, if we if there are any changes if they've responded to sort of what's going on in the industry. Great, right. true. That's a great idea. Yeah. So and with time. that. It's the same time, same day, 2023. <laughs> Next year, yes. Actually, that's a brilliant idea. So with that, I'd just like to thank you all very much for participating and, and providing your expertise here. Thanks. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Goodbye. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.